It is just beyond the hugest honor ever to be podcast interviewing today a legend, John McSpadden. Um, I remember um, my, the first working on my dental school, I went to 84 to 87 UMKC. And I think the first endodontist I ever heard of was you with the McSpadden condenser. And, uh, and then when I got out of school in 87, a couple of years later, I called you up and had some questions and you were just so lovable. You said, well, just come on down to Chattanooga. And here you're the most famous endodontist ever. I was a kid out of school, didn't know nothing. And you picked me up at the airport. I just thought, son of, is that Southern hospitality or you're just a hell of a good guy and you never stop innovating. You're always doing something. So what are you up to now? Well, I've had my hands shackled for quite a while because I had a, I was encumbered with a contract with Cybron. And uh, so I've had all of these ideas during that time, which has been 17 years. So I've come out with two new endodontic files, of course, and a few other things. It's, it's, it's been really interesting and a lot of fun. So, but I remember. So you, you, you had a, an endo file company before, and then what did maybe three. Three, well, walk, walk, walk us through the history. Of, you want to walk through the history of those or not really? You just want to forget the past, go well, to the in present? in 1976, eight or seven is when I came out with the compactor. And that's and the, the McSpadden and, compactor. Yeah, and also a two-fluted H-type instrument, which was the Burns Unifile and the Dynatrack instrument, which was used in a reciprocating handpiece. And uh, that was kind of an American dream because it went from four employees at the first of the year, 77, and by the end of the year, we had about 30 running three shifts, went from like 400 square feet to 30,000 square feet. And uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And it's been a lot of fun ever since then. Now, I remember you telling me back in the day that the uh, reason you got into engine-driven reciprocal, or, or ba basically, you were the one who started the revolution of going from a hand file to engine-driven. And in my mind, you, you, were, you, were, you were the guy who made that uh, leap. And you said at the time, put your hand up. You said it was because you're, uh, um, you were, I mean, how tall are you? 6'3". Yeah, you're 6'3". I'm 5'7". I got dentist hands. I mean, I, I, I and, but uh, you, you said it was because you were 6'3 and your hands were too big and you wanted help getting back there. Do you remember saying that? I might have. Basically, <laughs> it was just because I was lazy. Because <laughs> you were lazy? Always an easier way, yeah. I work very hard at finding easier ways. Nice. So. I work very hard at finding easier ways. That's a that's a hell of a quote. So um, so you're you're talking that this might be the biggest lecture you ever given. This show's gone viral. It's crazy. I mean, we upload these on uh, Facebook, and a lot of them um, are getting like thirty three thousand views. And then we put them on iTunes, Google Play, Dental Town, YouTube. Um, where where do you want to start this presentation? Do you want to? Um, um, I am a firm believer. Every time someone emails me from the show, Howard at Dentaltown.com, they're usually 20% are seniors in dental school and or juniors, seniors in dental school. And the 80% it seems like they're all young. Only maybe one out of a hundred is uh, some old guy like uh, you and me. They're, so they're all kids. Where, where do you want to, how do you want to start this uh, presentation? I mean, you're a legend in endo. You oh, could share so really much. That's kind of a stretch, but. Uh, no, what do you mean a stretch? You are a legend in endo. Well, I appreciate you saying it. But I want to say I remember you. I, that's been 20, what, seven years ago? Yeah. I remember your first, uh, my first conversation with you. You had been to Mexico. You were doing some humanitarian work there. And you were met with a situation that was much more dire than you thought. Uh, because they didn't need fillings or extractions, they needed health. And as I remember, you actually bought a drugstore or something like that to treat them. You're a, that is a, you got a good memory. You, have, and, you must have no dementia in your family. And you had some young fellows to meet you with rifles on this old trail, and somehow you talked them out of we were we were in a camp in Chiapas, and um, I um, before we went down there, I thought uh, um, I would check the State Department, 
and they had a travel advisory on there. And they said, don't go there. That's a Chiapas uprising, an Indian uprising with the Mexican government, and uh, they want their land back and all this stuff. And so I uh, called the guy, and he was a uh, he was a minister. His name was Larry. I said, there, you know, before I go, yeah, I got four kids. There's there's a travel advisor on this. He's, oh, no, you're fine. I had no idea in his brain that meant because we're doing God's work, so God will protect us. That's what he meant. So we were in that camp, and the first two or three days, we kept hearing pop, 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 in the hillsides. We're just like looking out there. And it was like the third or fourth night, um, the, the, the line moved across our campsite, and we were woken up. You know, they were... Uh, you know they had guns and automatic weapons and all this stuff and um it was so sad because they had those weapons and they had wallets and credit cards and a thousand bucks cash but they were stealing food and shoes and i said wow you know i, I don't think they recognized the debit card at the time but yeah we drove into town because we we're looking at all these people that had, they had worms and scabbies and all this stuff and i said what are we doing so um, we're just fixing their teeth, so we um, we drove in and we found a doctor to hire a doctor and uh, went into a pharmacy and you know it was about the size of a one car garage and just dumped everything, just bought everything he had on the shelves and took that doctor back to the camp and uh, so we, you know we were fixing their teeth and he was deworming them and scabbies on them and all that stuff like that and uh, it was all under the leadership of uh, Jerome Smith who's just uh, I think he's the patron saint of dentistry. He's taught so many people. The virtues of missionary dentistry so you start out the first time i heard your name was the mcspadden condenser so were you originally a um a squirter a, a warm gutta percha i was yeah and and my friend who was i think one of the smartest endodontists that ever lived uh joe dovkin who passed away mm -hmm. two years ago um he was a squirter actually that was before squirting time that was before squirting yeah, time do, was, do you remember joe dovkin yeah yeah no this was uh the uh, guru at that time was Herb Shelter. Right. And that was, you'd take a segment of gutta percha and you heat a plugger and you go in and watch the smoke and hear the sizzle and then you pack it to place and you add another one and, and another one and it would take maybe, um, you know, gosh, an hour or so to, longer than that, to obturate canals. So, being as lazy as I am, <laughs> I, I have uh, essentially four watchwords I've always lived by, and that is combine, simplify, eliminate, and enhance. And actually, combine, simplify, simplify, eliminate, and enhance. All right. And what I do is, for every procedure I've ever done, if I don't do it, I should have done it, or anything I've done constructively, I always look back and think I should have done it had I not done it. And that was to make type of a, a mileage chart. I would put down every step of the procedure, okay, vertically, and then the same steps horizontally, like a mileage chart. And I'd go from A to C, and I'd say, well, can I combine these? Can I simplify these? Can I eliminate part of it? Can I enhance it? And so essentially the compactor, the frictional heat of the rotation softened or plasticized the gutter percha. Okay, the cones of the instrument were essentially like the pluggers, okay? So you have the compactor was shaped pretty much like this. So as this rotated, it plasticized the gutta percha. These little shelves here, our surfaces here, were like the pluggers. And as it rotated, it was a reverse spiral, so these pluggers were progressed toward the tip of the instrument. And so it would plasticize, plug it, and pack it all at the same time, which each procedure was done individually. And that was kind of a combine the plugger with this, combine the heating with the, plast with the frictional heat, and I eliminated the pluggers, the flame, that sort of thing. And it enhanced the 
the result because it would get into the intricacies of the canal that any other technique would not at that time. Um, Ryan, he mentioned a Herb Shelter. Um, did you ever find that Herb Shelter and Angela Sargeni debate on YouTube? Herb Shelter, S-C-H-I-L-D-E-R, versus right. Angela Sargeni. And I thought that that was interesting because you walked into that and said, you mentioned Herb Shelter at the time was the gear of dentistry. And the competing thought was in Europe um, Angelo exactly. Sargeni, who thought, well, you know what you need to do is you need to put some paraphernalia down there to kill all the germs. Exactly. While the Americans were saying, um, let's just take all, out all the germs. Right. And uh, so Angelo Sargeni's um, method really lost out to removing. Right. And uh, so what? What is? Um, so you know they say in Indo, it's not about what you put in the tooth; it's what you take out. Um, are you still a big? What, what are your thoughts on cleaning out a tooth? Well, it's only as good as you clean out. I mean, uh, an instrument, uh, files for instance, is only to facilitate your sealing it. But really the big thing is the irrigation and the killing of the microorganisms before anything else, before it's sealed. If, conceptually, if every microorganism were killed, then you wouldn't have to fill it. If you could prevent the contam recontamination of the of the canal. So if you could kill all the bacteria, you would even need to fill the empty birdhouse up with cement? That's probably true. I, I'm not sure about that, but that's probably true. So review for the kids. Um, well, do you believe that um, 100 years from now, gutta percha will still be the gold standard? I mean, you, you've always done a lot of work with condensers, files, uh, instruments. Um, is, is gutta percha still the standard of care and you that's a good question because i don't know and i'm not sure anyone else knows it has certainly withstood the test of time because it's been used for over 100 years in fact uh, gutta percha carriers have been used for over 100 years there was a um, uh, a dentist that gave a presentation at the new york odontological society I think it was in 1903 where he took a gold wire covered with mold and gutta percha and put it to place and cut it off and left it. So um, it's been around. If it is the standard of care 100 years from now, it's primarily because of the inertia of acceptance of the scientific community. And then that gold wire technique got popularized by another endodontist in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Ben Johnson. Exactly. Back about your time, too. Are you guys the same age, same time, same time? I may be a little older. I'm 76 or so. Damn, you look ma amazing. Um, and have you ever had a root canal? I did a root canal on myself. You did a root canal on yourself? No way. I Which tooth? A, Hopefully it was number eight. No, it's it a premolar. And about three o'clock in the morning, I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I went to the office and I uh, uh, gave myself an injection, but then I took out the headrest on the chair and put a mirror in its place and scooted up to the mirror and did the root canal. Wow. Did you, did you YouTube video it? No, I didn't. That, that I would be an amazing video. So so um so Thermo so Ben Johnson um, also saw that uh, gold wire technique from back in the day and, and then he started that, and yeah. um, that that kind of ran a court. Is that is that still a don is that still a very um, common oh, observation technique? Absolutely, and it's <clears throat> almost universally accepted. It would not be my choice, but I th and universally accepted with a metal carrier or a no, plastic no. carrier. There are some metal carriers still used, but it's primarily um, uh, plastic carriers. I, <clears throat> excuse me. And then he sold that Tulsa Dental <clears throat> Company to Dentsply. He did. Which is why it's called Tulsa Dental Products. Yeah, is, is he Tulsa still on board there? Is he still involved with it? I don't know how to answer that question because he is, but with the arm's length. I think that there's still a very tight relationship, um, and he may be still obligated to them, um, but on day-to-day -day activities and that sort of thing, I don't think so. So then you start off with the McSpadden condenser. 
Right. And then you, the next was uh, your, you came out with a NITI file. When, 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 what was <clears throat> well, the next was the Unifile and Dynatrack. Dynatrack was a reciprocating file. And that was stainless steel? That was stainless steel. But I thought it was an excellent instrument, as long as you knew the limitations. And I think that limitations are the one thing that is ignored much more than they should be. People are always talking about the benefits of instruments. As long as you know the limitations, you can do almost anything. <coughs> and there, there is still a reciprocating file on the market by an endodontist in They're coming in back. Everything seems to Safe have... Cider, right? Right. What's his... What's? Yeah, well, you caught me where I can't remember him. Um, I don't know. But actually, the Safe Cider started with Frank Wine. He took a file and would grind off one side of it and then curve it to where only the... Very loose yeah, exactly. And I, and I found it before I Googled it. I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, if, yeah. if Barry sees this, that I forgot his name. Well, Barry, it's only because I'm 53 old and senile. It's not because okay. I, I don't. But, uh, so, so he still has that reciprocating. Right. Yeah. But the first time I saw that concept popularized was with Frank Wine who is one of the grandfathers of endo. In fact, everything kind of comes around. Uh, you're familiar with the next file. Are you, are you familiar yeah, with Yeah, and, okay, and who makes that? Densply. But the original concept Tulsa, Tulsa was, Dental? I'm not sure it's Tulsa, but it is Densply. Um, original concept was from a dentist named Maynard in 1838. He took a watch spring, pulled it apart to have it shaped like a tornado, and he cut notches on the side of it. So that was really the first concept of the next file, which is a spiral type file. And so, and what what do you what do you think of that? I think it's good in several regards. Uh, by having it spiral rather than a solid with just grooves cut into it, which it actually is, but the grooves are cut so deep from a larger from a, a, a larger shaft that it looks like it's a spiral. And by spiral, I mean the, the center of mass is separate from the center of rotation. The center of mass is on the outside of the center of rotation. It offers more flexibility toward the handle, of course, and it uh, is more efficient in removing debris. Okay. Well, you guys don't know about John, which I've witnessed in my own house. I remember sitting in the front row of your lecture in Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and this guy asked a question, and John just walks up to the board and starts doing three-dimensional geometry calculus, fills up this entire board. It looks like Einstein's equals MC squared, and the whole room, you, you'd lost the room after the, like, like, like one you know, halfway through this equation, like this long, and you went all the way across the job where explaining this whole deal, and I swear to God, I've never seen a math instructor during calculus, geometry, trig, nothing. I, I never saw the witness, I, I think you uh, are more of a mathematician than anything else in your life, because you're, you're always talking about geometry, the shapes of the files, but you you have all the calculus and geometry and to, to back it up, I mean, it's, it's an amazing math mind you have. You wouldn't convince everyone of that, that's for sure. <laughs> you, you, a PhD mathematician might, have, might argue with that statement. That's right. But it's truly amazing. Oh, thanks. So, we're, so where's the state of files out? So, so basically, um, and it seems like when NITI files came out, um, the big deal was expense. And a lot of people um, would be using a lot of them. And it seems like um, so they've tried to make the files less cost, but more so than that, they've tried to use less files. So it seems like the market's trying to say, OK, instead of needing five files to do a root canal or I mean, I remember Kit Weathers Endo Magic. I mean, I remember the first time I went to Griffin, Georgia and took his course. He was recommending 10. You start with 10. And so I'm a single use guy because I don't want to autoclave them and break and I don't want to do that. So that, that was a big um, factor to consider. Do I really want a technique that's going to take 10 files? Um, do you see that where the market's trying to make less expensive files and fewer files for I expensive do, but purposes? I think that uh, 
sometimes the most expensive thing you do is to try to save money. And I, I mean, it's, for me, it's like, how many wrenches do you need to work on a car? How many threads do you need to hold on a sleeve? You know, it's whatever is necessary. So it's much more efficient to do what is needed rather than to try to make do with what you have, particularly smaller instruments or fewer instruments. So I always had the next instrument that I needed in place. So there was no time lost in changing from one instrument to another. As I got through with one instrument, I just held my hand up and the next hand piece was put in my hand to continue. So the most valuable commodity that we have is time. And time is much more valuable than instruments. So if it requires 10 instruments, fine. If it requires five or one, then that's fine too. But it's whatever is appropriate for, for the task that you're trying to accomplish. The most controversial article we ever published on Dentaltown Magazine that got more buzz, and at least half of it hate mail for Minute Honest, was a guy from Texas called named Scott Perkins, and he wrote an article called The 15-Minute Root Canal. And it was completely taken out of context because of what you just said. He wasn't saying that, you know, do a fast, quick root canal. But I went to his office with Jerome Smith and about six other dentists to, to witness this. And like say, he, you know, a dentist will use a file, then he'll take it out, then he's changing the file and he's looking for the next burr. And Scott had, Scott had like six um, slow speeds right there. I mean, so mm -hmm. when he sat down, his high speed access prep, all of his burr, he, so he, he, he was going through this that, uh, you know, you waste so much uh, time yeah. changing files and, and he was doing uh, root canals so fast, but it, but the actual time of working on the tooth probably wasn't any different than any ended on us. He just the, did it in half the time. The most awakening thing that I ever did was to video record a case that I was doing through the microscope. And that was done like in 1978. And there was nothing happening. And you thought, oh, what is going on? I mean, is the system mixing the sealer? Am I changing the instrument? What is happening? Because there was so much idle time that nothing was happening on the video. And I thought, how can I get rid of all that idle time? How can I make every part of it productive? So I'm not fast, just like the fellow you're talking about. But I didn't waste time. The we were talking about this before. I had a rubber dam clamp. They had four little collars. Four for two of the collars were this was a collar worth soldered on to the rubber dam clamp. Okay, on one side I stuck a fiber optic fiber. On the other side I stuck a fiber optic fiber. So I had translamination. Then I had two silver needles. On one side I burnished. You may have even been there at that time because that was early on. I would burnish the silver needle over uh, the access cavity, and that was for irrigation. On the other side, the silver needle was burnished over the access cavity for suction. So it was continuous irrigation and suction. And I had foot controls that were much like a ham and organ, because I could change from one to the other. Okay, so I would start off irrigating with sodium hypochlorite, and then I'd use ETA, and then I'd use distilled water, and then I would use alcohol, and all that was done without the assistant. Is it ED, EDTA? EDTA? Yeah. Uh, and that was, it was not just, so, well, it was primarily sodium hypochlorite to start with. And then it was EDTA, and then it was EDTA and sodium hypochlorite. I'd rinse it out with water, put alcohol in it because it dissipated and evaporated very quickly. And you may remember the old Cavitron, which you could turn the power up, ultrasonic instrument until any instrument you had in it would almost fly apart. And I put a silver cone in the Cavitron, and I would use it to both potentiate the sodium hypochlorite, but also after the alcohol, it would dry the canal. So I'd only have to use like one absorbent point, and that was only to ascertain that it was dry. So it just did away with a lot of stuff. Uh, and the 
activation of the sodium hypochlorite by ultrasonic means also potentiated it. So that made the time shorter for that as well. And what do you mean by potentiate the hydrogen? Well, any time you add heat and agitation, then you get an increase in the efficacy of the solution. So basically, the sodium hypochlorite was an oxidizing agent. Okay, so it would speed up the chemical reaction. So let, let's talk about the other end of this. Um, one of the things that I think is um, hilarious um, from general dentists <clears throat> is, you know, they, they don't realize that by the time the average dentist gets 5,000 charts, 4,000 of them are inactive. And you can figure this out where if a height... Oh, but by the time the average general dentist gets to 5,000 patient records, oh, okay. 4,000 of them are inactive patients. And you can measure this in the hygiene where if a hygienist works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, she works 2,000 hours, okay. she can only see 1,000 people twice a year. And the, the point I'm making that 4,000 are inactive is because almost almost every, endodontist, every general dentist you say, you'll say, well, you know, how often do your root canals fail? Or what's your survival rate of your root canal? Half of them will go. Well, you know, John, knock on wood, I've never had one fail. So then you go meet the 4,000 full-time endodontists in the United States, and you say, you know, these general dentists, they never have any root canals fail, so are you doing all new cases? And they go, no, we're doing two-thirds, three-fourths retreats. Right. So, um, so, you know, you, you have to have a very, very good recall system and practice a long time before you start realizing root canals fail. Um, what do you think is the state of root canals in the United States? What do you think their success rate is, and why? Um, how how can we do it so that less of them fail, so we don't keep those endodontists so busy? I think the biggest problem is it's easy to make a root canal look good. Now, and so when it looks good and it has a puff, and you see three canals and a molar or whatever, you think, well, it's pretty successful, and you take one view of an x-ray and it's perpendicular to the buckle so you think well that looks pretty good and you may see the uh, the radiolucency begin to fill in and whatever so it's easy like you say to uh, you don't see your own work and I'm sure I've had a lot of success what I call geographic success where they just move away or move on to another dentist or whatever, and if it failed, it was extracted. Or particularly now, because just be you, this needs to come out. And we're going to put an implant in its place. So I don't know. The st the statistic says in uh, endodontics somewhere between 90 and 95 per percent success. At, at how many years? Five. Well, I think if it hasn't failed in five years, then it's going to be around for a while. So you would, you would so, say that would root canals fail, they would be more likely to fail in the uh, out of the gate? Pretty much so. How, how, so how, how also soon? you can kind of maintain pathology to an acceptable degree. The radiolucency may never clear up. It may continue to be a little sensitive to percussion, but it lasts 20 years. You know, so honestly, you're asking some questions I don't know. And uh, there have been studies where they follow them 5, 10, 15 years on pretty sophisticated recall systems, and it looks like 19 to, uh, 90 to 95 percent success. Yeah. But some of those should not have been done to start with. I do have the weirdest endo failure case. I've had, only had one bizarro. A guy came in with a toothache, and I, I took a um, full set of x-rays. He had three root canals, done three different ways at three different times. One was a silver point, and the other one was uh, you know different types of uh, lateral condensation, bro condensation. And he was um, about 60 years old, and all three were failing. And I just looked at that and I said, "Well, I'm just not going to go in and retreat three root canals. I think something's wrong with him." So I said, you, you need to go to your physician. You know, you're not in excruciating pain or anything. He just was, it was sore. And he thought he had a toothache. And I sent him to that physician, and that physician, uh, the, the, his wife came back, the, uh, I think, uh, the next day or two days later and said he had full-blown leukemia. Oh, yeah. So he had lost his entire immune system, so yeah. everything was failing. I just thought that was so bizarre. I've yeah. only seen that once in my life. So, so um, let, let's walk through... Um, a uh, root canal. Um, 
you mentioned okay for, first of all um let, let's start just with you know if you want to be a, a better quality dentist magnification is always you know loops is better than a naked eye um do you recommend a scope for endo do you use a scope should a general dentist really have a scope you know i had some referring dentists two things they'd either want me to do the cram prep for them or i wanted to do it for them because their dentistry was not so good <laughs> with the <clears throat> the microscope like i said i've been my first microscope was a laboratory stereoscopic scope okay and i changed the lens to give me the focal distance that i needed so i had a, a 13 pound laboratory scope that i put over my on my overhead lamp so i could pull it back and forward i like the scopes much better than the loops because the loops you're looking away and you have to find your focal distance again. I have not practiced in 19 years now, but I can tell you my focal length is right here. This is exactly where it was 19 years ago. I'm within two millimeters right now of what my focal length was. So 19 years, how old, how old are you now? 76. So, what, so how old were you when you quit? Well, it was 19 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I got I got to subtract. So it's actually I got to subtract. It was uh, 67. Yeah. And uh, th that do you uh, do you miss that? I mean, I'm I'm surprised a guy like you just didn't walk in there someday last month and just do a root canal for for the hell of it. Do you do you, do you miss clinical or? Howard, I don't miss it at all. Hmm. And the I really enjoyed doing it. I don't mean that I didn't enjoy it because I really enjoyed it. Actually, I had a passion for it. And I got to the point that I felt like I couldn't get any better. And I was always hoping for a more complicated case, you know, so to try your skills, so to speak. So it was a challenge. But I went 13 years without a single vacation. And all my friends in Europe were taking a month off or longer. So I decided one October, I'm going to take a month off. So. October came and went, November came and went, December came and went, and I still have my practice and my staff there. About halfway through January, my wife's name is Jane. I said, Jane, I've got to get back to the office. And she said, well, it's too late now. I've canceled your malpractice insurance. She had taken my name out of the phone book several years earlier. So I didn't retire. I just didn't show up anymore. I quit. So, um, by the well, way, you live in one of the most beautiful areas of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and um, I love that hotel where it was the old train. Yeah, the choo choo. The choo choo train. I mean, what what a what a fun town! Beautiful. You get all the four seasons without any extremes. Right. Ten oh, Tennessee. You come again. It's been uh, a long I would time. love to. Tennessee is just gorgeous, and I want to stay in that train. <laughs> oh, you're going to stay with me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, it's. Uh, so and, the question was, do I miss it? No, I don't. I it's don't. also Tennessee. I've sent my mother everywhere. I mean, I've sent her to, you know, Israel, all, all Rome, London. I've sent her, uh, yeah, you know, everywhere. And her favorite place is still Opera Land, USA. Okay. I mean, she, she never talks about Rome or Paris or London or Tel Aviv She's, or Jerusalem. It's always uh, Opera Land, USA. I mean, God dang, she just... That was just the cat's meow for my mom. Yeah. We enjoy it. Yeah. So. So, so um, but back to the question. Do you think um, a general dentist um, should have a scope? I think if he wants to be more efficient, he needs to have a scope. Um, you can just see so much more. It may take you several attempts to thread a needle without a scope. With a scope, you can probably thread a needle without hitting the sides of the, you know, of, of the eye of the needle. Your hand is not limited by what your hand can do. Your hand is limited by what your hand can see. You know, so I could prepare a crown subgingivally without causing any bleeding, because I knew exactly where the gingiva was. So what my you know, scope? So there's. Kind of a low-cost one, uh, global out of St. Louis, and there's a high-cost German one, Zeiss. What, which one do you recommend? I think in between is probably best. In between. <laughs> well, global has fantastic service, and the 
the the nice thing, however, is that there's not nearly as much difference as there used to be because the lands used to be ground by hand. Now it's all computerized. So the grinding program for one computer is just as good as another. So you end up with some pretty good lands. I see. So. Yeah. So you the know, low cost global and the high cost ice are about the same quality. As far as the visual capabilities are concerned, mm -hmm. yes. And you know, magnification, and everything. I mean, you got to go to loops. Um, how much do you think one of these uh, microscopes would would cost? Would you mount it on the ceiling? Would you would you roll it in? Well, I never touch my microscope. On my microscope, the first thing I did was. I might be getting. You want me to lay, my, you me lay my head in your lap and no, you no, can no. pretend I'm a patient? But the first thing I did was to get exactly in the position that I wanted. And to do that, I had the dental stool that had a curved back. So I took two dental stools, stools I took the curves back and put, in, put them in. For little, elbow rest. Right. So it had the same radius as my arms moving. So I got exactly where I wanted. Okay, and there's very little difference between working on an upper or lower or anterior or posterior other than just the tilt of the patient's head, okay, which is very little. You can stick a, a ruler in a patient's mouth and turn them a half inch this way and it might be three inches up here, okay, or this way and it might be four inches or whatever. So they're not uncomfortable. So I get exactly where I want it for the microscope. And then we put a magic marker mark on every single joint, okay? So that's where I want the microscope to be, and then I want the patient to accommodate that position rather than me accommodating where they sit down and just, and, and you have to position, uh, you lean over, bend over, tilt your head or whatever to make so it So is this open. a ceiling mount then? I've had both because it didn't matter, I didn't touch it. Yeah. So it, uh, you want some place where it doesn't vibrate. But to keep it from vibrating, I wore safety glasses and I just barely touched the lens and that would keep it from vibrating. So. Uh, Say that again, to keep it from vibrating, you do what? Yeah, you wear safety glasses and as soon as you touch the eyepiece, you can stop the vibration. If you just touch it lightly. So there's not a whole lot of vibration as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I had two laser pointers that were attached to my microscope. So you say, Ms. Jones, close your eyes just a second. I'm going to put this over your eyes. And then the assistant would make sure that the two pointer beams came together exactly where I wanted it on the first molar or whatever the case may be. Okay, so it was exactly in focus. So all I had to do was come in and sit down my stool and scoot up, and I was there. There was no change in the position of the patient or a You know, a laser pointer was the first laser I bought. I owned up my practice September 21, 87. And like the first week, somebody called and asked if uh, I had a laser. And we always track getting to yes. So we tracked every time we told the customer no. And I would read these notes because, okay. you know, I'm so supply and demand. And so I, I thought to myself, oh, my God, I, you know, I, I got to say yes. And I don't have a laser. So I went right to Radio Shack and I bought a laser pointer for like 70 bucks so I could say yes. I have a laser in the office. <laughs> always, always use it to explain everything on the X-ray and everything else. Yeah. And uh, but um, so so let, let's go back to uh, the, the failures. You say probably a ninety ninety five percent success rate. So one in ten probably fail. And and what would you say? Let, let's go through the top three reasons why they fail. Do you think missed canals is number one, where a scope or would you can help go a with that? Beyond that, be inadequate instrumentation which also includes irrigation. So, so yes. So you, you put miss canal. Well, you, uh, you don't like calling it miss canal just under instrumentation. Exactly. Well, but, but more specific on miss canal, because I'm trying to think how, how much would these microscopes cost me? What's, what's a global cost and a Zeiss cost? What's the price of those today? Somewhere around 15,000. So, so that would be 15 root canals to, uh, to buy one. So do you, do you think the $15,000, is kind of mandatory because um, it would help you see that missed, missed canal. I think that the microscope is much more valuable than that. I gave the injection with the microscope. I put on the rubber dam 
clamps with the microscope. I did everything with the microscope. In the early days, if my microscope lamp went out, I'd, re I'd re schedule patients until I could get new lamps. Uh, so consequently, that only happened once or twice, but uh, I did everything. But that made you put a microscope in another room? <laughs> when you cancel the day of root canals, I bet that made you go back and say, okay, we need two ops with microscopes. Well, yeah, I only, I've only had the most operatories I've ever had since general practice has been one operatory. Wow. When you came from my office, I only had one operatory. Yeah. So um, when I was in general dentistry, I had four operatories, and they were usually full. So and that's right. You you were the, the the a lot of the older endodontists were just grandfathered in. They just mm -hmm. they, they just um, were general dentists to just practice limited to endo. I can't call myself an endodontist because I was in that crack between being grandfathered in and it being a specialty. But every when did it become a specialty? That was in nineteen seventy three, I think. Wasn't Ben Johnson the same thing? Wasn't he a general dentist? No, I think he no, he's had training. He went to endo school? Yeah. And and I meet dentists um today where um you go to a small town, there's five dentists and someone decides they want to go back to endo school and they tell their four buddies and they just say, Well, don't go to endo school, just do practice limited to endo and if you don't do the crown and bridge and the fillings and the hygiene and all that and I mean I, I know several cities where a general dentist just changed from he's not an ended on us he just says practice limit endo and right. i know a pediat pediatric dentist who went to the other six seven dentists in her town said i just want to do kids so she just says you know practice limited to pediatric well, that's um that's what happened to me however all the professors at that time that uh gave you the training were grandfather so it wasn't that unusual for me at that time because it was right after it became a specialty or right or right before I could have told a fib and said that 50% of my practice was endo at that time and been certified, but I haven't. So I've never been able to hang out my shingle as root canals or endodontists or anything like that. However, I think I built one of probably the largest endo practices in the world and um, have lectured at virtually, well, certainly more than half the endo programs. In the United States, so. Well, I said at the beginning of the program, you're a legend, and you're you're no, the no, one no. denying it. I mean, I, I I mean, you're one of the most commonly referred. When I'm talking to a general dentist or talking about endo techniques, you're the most commonly cited name. One 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 of the most. I mean, there's just a handful. You know, it's ironic, not ironic, but it's, it's interesting that the condenser now has been a generation ago, and now people are rediscovering it, and that seems to be the big the greatest inquiry is how do I get these condensers but it's still kind of the uh, technique of choice in Brazil and France and several other places that you know very popular and it's lost popularity here and now it's regaining it the popularity because people have seen it for the first time and it would be my technique of choice for operation today. Well, you know, I, I hang that map on the wall over there um, behind this is a global map, and I put that in the, in our the, our break room. I mean, our conference room to remind everybody because I, I think a lot of Americans they always think of the United States of America. And the United States is only five percent of the world's population. It's only there's two hundred eleven thousand people alive in the United States have a dental degree. Probably only one hundred and fifty thousand are doing over thirty two hours a week. But that's a big world out there, and uh, my gosh, the variance in dentistry and techniques. I mean, you just go to country after country, e even countries where you think, oh, this will be exactly like the United States, like Poland, and, and it's not. I mean, it's, it's a huge variance. Well, it can variance. be very humbling as well. I've been humble many times, seeing things that I didn't see in the United States. We tend to be much more provincial here. We read our journals, you know, if it's not a journal in the United States, you hardly see it. If you go to Europe, then you see all these other journals that they learn from. So we're missing out in that regard, I think. But don't you think Europe's like that too? Don't you think the Italians read their Italian journals and the Germans read their German journals? I mean, do you? I mean, I think the internet is starting this cross pollinization on Facebook and Dental Town and things like that. But it's still pretty provincial, don't you think? We get probably more as much. 
we get half as much correspondence from the Middle East, for instance, as we do from the United States. It's amazing. Well, du so, yeah, Dubai, Dubai's kind of been the center of that, and Middle Easterns are big fans of uh, United States dentistry, aren't they? Right. But it's the same all over. I mean, you mentioned Poland, the same there. Uh, but in, in, I what, what percent not, of the dentists from the Middle East that you correspond with um, read and speak or understand English? Well, everyone we hear from speaks English because that's the only way we can correspond. They're, they're, uh, okay, you're talking on the phone, not just email? Just email. That, that's that's the biggest change I've I seen in my career. My son that you met over the... Facebook, um, he talks to them quite a lot, maybe an hour at a time sometimes. That, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. When I started lecturing overseas in 1990, you always had a translator. Right. And now you, you never do. No. I mean, you go back to those same countries where in 1990, there was a translator, maybe 10% maybe of the class could understand you and a couple could kind of talk. Right. And now it's just, I don't, I don't care where you go. You just, there's just hardly ever a translator. Yeah. I needed two translators. One from <laughs> Tennessee to English. And then. Uh, that, that is one of the common things I, I hear about, um, uh, even feedback on this podcast, where you know you go to uh, Singapore or Japan or whatever, and they say, you know, I understand English, but some of those guys on your show, I, 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 it's hard. You know, there's so many dialects of English from here to London right. to Kansas. But um, So you recommend a scope, and, and we, which one would you recommend? I think virtually all of them are pretty Scope's good. Scope's a scope. You, you say the computers are grinding yeah. the lens, so it really doesn't matter. Right. Okay, and um, obviously a rubber dam. Uh, oh, there, yeah, there's still people that uh, fight that, but it's. Uh, no, I tell them if, they, if you don't like placing rubber dam, then have your assistant fight it. So then let's go to, um, let's, let's go to files. Okay. Um, help my homies out here. Um, like when you talk about implants, my gosh, if you went to the um, Cologne meeting, there were 175 different implant systems. Exactly. And my whole my whole deal with Dentaltown was with Dentaltown.com, no dentist would ever have to practice solo again. And it's up to 215,000 dentists. And so, you know, whenever I'm talking to an implant guy and you walk in there and say, help my homies out. I mean, how do you analyze 175 systems? And endophiles is the same boat. I mean, there are so, how many endo systems are there out there? Well, so many of them are so much alike. But uh, I think you could kind of, boil it down to maybe 15 you could boil it down to 15 and 15 still an overwhelming decision so yeah but let, let, let's talk endophiles what okay what what uh um there's reciprocating there's stainless steel there's night tie there's you know what help, well, them, I, help them out i'd certainly go with night tie although i'm not convinced that that's the best and i'm working with other materials right now it used to be you mentioned 1990 in 1990, when you mentioned stainless steel, that was pretty much one alloy. Now then, it's an umbrella of over a hundred different alloys. And there may be some, actually I found an alloy that was better than nickel titanium. The problem was the expense. Uh, I spent an awful lot of money on the alloy. Uh, it was tougher by that. It had the flexibility, but also had the resistance to torsional failure as well. But it was very, very expensive because it, it was usually not, usually molybdenum trades higher than gold or silver, or platinum or palladium. So some some of those I mean some of those metals are extremely expensive, more so than gold. Yeah, exactly. So you have to have one that's practical as far as expense goes, um, and then it has to be a, an a obvious ad, advantage. You know, because there's no use in, I had a material called Nitai X, uh, which was pretty good. Uh, my patent attorney and I actually got the patent for it, and he was a musician, so he used it for guitar strings, uh, strings and piano strings because it had a characteristic sound, and it would not get out of tune. Uh, but it turned out to be more expensive as well, so it wasn't practical. So, uh, so you recommend a night type file, absolutely, and you and you recommend it going all the way around. Um, what did the the because the, the reciprocating did the reciprocating files have less breakage? 
And is breakage an issue anymore, or was or was that an issue in the '90s? And does 2016? What's the status of breakage on a file? Breakage now? is still an issue, but you're lucky if it's a problem. If that's the only problem that you have because it can be very easily prevented. I can give you three sentences to and guarantee you, you will not ever break another file. It doesn't matter what instrument you use or what size you use. You, ha you approach the canal with pecs, okay? You don't want to allow the instrument to go in more than one millimeter at a time, okay? If it wants to pull in, don't let it. If people say to go in until you meet resistance, don't listen. One millimeter at a time, okay? But no less than one half a millimeter's worth of progress, okay? So if you, <coughs> with the same pressure, if you can push with a certain pressure and not increase that pressure, and make one half a millimeter's progress with each peck, then you continue. You can continue to use that instrument until it meets resistance. As soon as it meets resistance, get out. Okay. Okay. Let, let's back up for my homies. Um, okay. When you find the canals, are you going to um, hand instrument first, or are you the top down guys where you like to start with a forty-five and then yeah, a forty and a thirty-five? It doesn't matter. But a lot of people, for instance, like to use a hand instrument up to a 25 and I introduced nickel titanium instruments in 1991 if I had to use a hand instrument and, and enlarge a canal to a 20 or a 25 I'd never use a, a motorized canal again because then you've done everything it's very easy for me to get to place with every other file after it's enlarged to so you're saying to hand file the 25 it wouldn't take any much longer to go I haven't up. picked up a hand instrument that I can remember since 1991. Since 1991, wow! So you do the whole thing. What would now? What do you call that? With engine driven? Is that is that engine the, driven? Yeah. So you do the entire root canal engine driven yeah, since we, 1991. We're talking in past tense now, but no, I didn't. There was just nothing. Okay. I could do you start? Do you start um, smallest file or largest file? Do you go top down or bottom up? Whatever is necessary. Actually, I liked, uh, if, and I would make my own tip on my initial file, okay? I would make, I would rotate the handpiece. I have another handpiece with a, a diamond disc. I would rotate the file against the diamond disc and make a bullet shape on the end, okay? And then I would put a flat about to the center. I'd stop the rotation and let the diamond disc rotate against the tip a second. And I have a flat. If I rotated that 10 degrees, for instance, that flat would look like this. Okay, so if you're in a curvature like that, on the smooth side, it would deflect around the curvature. As it rotated 180 degrees, then you'd have a cutting edge here, right? So it would cut and flip and cut and flip and cut and flip its way down. The other thing that you're doing is if you're blades start back here, you required a canal that was this big. If it were smaller than that big, then you'd have to burnish your way into the canal, right? So when it's this big, it go, when it's cut down to the middle of the, the tip of the instrument, now you can get into a canal that's less than half that size. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for instance, my favorite instrument now if I'm using extracted teeth, is to use a 2506, but it has a special tip on it. It has enough rigidity that I can push on it without making a Hawkins stick on it. But it has the cutability of going into a 0.13 millimeter canal, even though it's a 2506. And that will get me into the canal. So are you doing, would you recommend doing that today? I mean, you have to- Oh, absolutely. So, so you're you're saying that when you buy a oh, and I, well, now we have our own instruments made this way. The, these are your your instrument line. Yeah, and that's so. What, what's the name? What's the name of your instrument line? I only have two instruments, and they're built on the same concept. They include two different tapers within the same instrument. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> Can 
can I draw here? Absolutely. So you. Ordinarily, your instrument is shaped like this, and this is your taper. Okay? It starts the. Are you left handed? Yeah. Wow. The new instruments start off having a symmetrical tip. In other words, if it's triangular, it's triangular at the tip. But if you incorporate a different taper on one of these blades toward the handle, it changes from a triangle. You incorporate another flute, it changes to a trapezoid. Okay? That is almost counterintuitive because now instead of three cutting blades, you have two. All right? So you think, well, why would it cut better? Well, these two blades engage with the same force as the three did before. As it changes from a triangle to a trapezoid, and it becomes even more so toward the handle, then you have more flexibility. And you have also more room to accumulate debris. Okay? What people don't realize is debris can account for as much as 50% of the torsional stress on the instrument. Conceptually, with a triangle here, as you rotate it one time, these flutes can fill up with debris. And when that occurs, two things occur. One is the cutting edge cannot engage as much, and the debris in here can cause frictional stress on the instrument because it becomes compacted in there. And an instrument that has a whole bunch of spirals, like this, for instance, that debris has a long way to travel, and it doesn't do so very efficiently. So the big thing is getting it out, the, out of there. So you have two, you have the auger ability of the spiral of the instrument, but you also have the augering ability of it becoming more like a corkscrew. Okay, so it's more efficient in removing debris. So you said the th three things to not break files. Review. Okay. Go in with a pecking motion and don't go in more than one millimeter at a time. Always make at least one half a millimeter's worth of progress with the same perceptional type of pressure. If you can't, change instruments, okay? And when you change instruments, always change to a file that has a different taper. The reason, as you know, for tapers to begin with, if you have a instrument that's smaller than the taper of the canal, it only engages initially at the apex. If you have an <coughs> instrument that has a larger taper than the canal, you only engage coronally. So you want to start a new, if you have an instrument that has the same taper as the canal, you immediately have too much stress, too much engagement. What causes stress? One is the amount of engagement, okay? So you try to minimize your engagement. The whole objective is for efficient instrumentation is to minimize stress and maximize efficiency. Okay, so those are the three things. No more than a millimeter, always make a half a millimeter's worth of progress with the same pressure. If you can't, get out and change to another instrument but when you change, I don't care whether you go up and down or size, change to one with a different taper. So if you do that, Howard, I'll challenge you to break an instrument. So let, let's, um, let, let's talk about um, um, what, what everybody worries about on the message boards on Dentaltown and Orlando. Some people think that the, um, the 04, 06, it, it's too much tooth removal. And a lot of people are wondering if we're weakening the, the tooth by too big of a taper. And um, and then then and then follow that in with the other million dollar question: to post or not to post? I never really believed in post. I don't advocate n not using post. Um, I, I agree. Why, why why wouldn't you go on the line and advocate not using a post? Because there's a lot of people who believe that the only thing a post does is uh, it's just set a, up a fracture. I I have seen some cases that. I've seen cases in Europe where they did three sections of a crown, one for each 
root. And they were dovetailed together and they're the most beautiful restorations I've ever seen. And they did it with a post. Now, <clears throat> when the post is part of the crown and they diverge when they're not parallel, then it required three sections. But they were beautiful. That's one of the times I was humble. Um, but but is that a, but is placing a post I, does that combine simplify eliminate and enhance the root canal success and longevity? I don't think you enhance the strength of the tooth with a post. Conceptually, I guess you could enhance, particularly with these posts that supposedly become chemically bound to the tooth, uh, that you might be able to enhance uh, retention. But retention only comes into play when it becomes loose. So if it never became loose, you'd never have a problem with retention. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Explain that again. Okay. Retention only comes into place after the post becomes loose or the restoration becomes loose. If, there, if it never becomes loose, then retention is not a problem, right? So the problem has already been, has begun if you need retention. Does that make sense? Yes. Now there might be situations where you enhance the um, balance, so to speak, of the occlusal forces so that it doesn't loosen up so much. But I'm not so sure about that. And now you're talking about calculus that would really require some modeling to find so out. So what, what is the name of your file and what is the, the website? The website is nanoendo n-a-n-o-e-n-d-o dot com. So it's nano which means billionth? It means small. Oh it just means small? In, in metric I thought. Yeah, so it's uh, www.nanoendo.com that's right. And what will my homies find on that website? Two file systems? It will, but it's, uh, it's more or less, the website's kind of a rabbit hole of where you want to go. It has, Is it the matrix? <laughs> it um, has a lot of information, some of which is about the files, mostly about the files. But it's everywhere. You can also download the book to questions and answers and that sort Down, of thing. You can download this book electronically? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Email, PDF, how does that work? Or? Yeah, you can do PDF or if you. So, talk about your book, Mastering Endodontic Instrumentation by John T. McSpadden, DDS. I'm going with John Thomas. That's right. Did I guess it right? You're right. John Thomas McSpadden, DDS. So, when did this book come out? Well, you have the other one in your hand. <laughs> I have the other one in my hand. You mean yeah. <laughs> this is the second copy? <laughs> no, no. No. Um, this came out in. 2005 I think and so it's due a uh, an addendum um, it's uh, what it is is a computation of all the questions that I've been asked if you open it up any place you want to virtually any place you want to you see it's in question form with the answers so those are kind of from A to Z of all the questions I've had and then it also encompasses about 1,200 different evaluations of files that we've done to, sus to substantiate the mechanics of how a file works. I have a... Um, and if they, they go to nanoendo.com, they can download this? Yeah. And then what would, it, would, it, would all those photos be in there? Uh, they can be, yeah. Yeah. And how much, how much is the book on your website? I don't even know. I mean, why does anybody want one? If they'll ask me for one, I'll probably give them one. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you can download it. Okay. And the book does come, this one, I'm sorry I didn't bring it, with a, uh, uh, a DVD. So anytime you've found something in red, then you could download the video as well. You know, John, um, there's, you know, there's so many market segments. I mean, like GM has a... Cadillac and a Buick and a Olds and and uh, it's so interesting how the book segment um, you and I we grew up sitting down reading books Amazon now half their sales are audiobooks oh yeah 
So um, that might be something you might do. Some, you might just sit down someday. Um, Skype is a good sound file. You can just sit down at your computer and read the book. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's hard because for me, I like the simplest language. One thing I don't like about books, particularly textbooks, is, is that they're so embellished. So I've tried to condense everything down. And when you what do, do you mean that, they're so embellished? <clears throat> They hit the point, and then they keep selling the vacuum cleaner. I like all the nitty-gritty. I mean, you go to a lecture, and you get two, three, four things out of it, and you've listened all day, you know. And so so much of the time, it's the same way with the textbook. I like just exactly what the point is and how it makes it was it's logical and how it makes how it as substantiating so I want the gray matter that's presented I want to back up what's presented and I want it um, that's interesting how you said um you said how you go to a lecture and you sit there all day and you learn three things dental town um uh, on the app John if you come look over here we started uh this room um we we um we start online CE, and they're you know they're shorter courses, are mostly an hour, hour and a half. We put up three hundred and fifty courses. They've been viewed over six hundred thousand times, wow. because the generation Xers and millennials would rather uh, lay on their couch and and uh, turn it on and watch an hour at a time, yeah. than fly across the country, go to a convention, sit there all day long. Plus, you don't have to take notes because you could just. If you want to go back, you just back to go go right exactly. back to the course. It would be the biggest honor on earth if you would create us a course one day. I do one a day if you like. I, I, I would I would love that because um um the, the bottom line about Indo is when these general dentists when they get out of school with three hundred fifty thousand dollars of student loans, if they if they just have one bad decision, say you know what I don't like Indo. My God, it's a thousand dollars insurance pays eighty percent. And if their practice is limited to cleaning exams and x-rays and fillings and crowns, a crown is about the only thing they're in the profit zone on. And yeah. if they if they just say they don't like molar endo, I mean, I mean, they need to do three or four big things a day. And a big thing that's in the profit zone is only going to be a crown, a root canal, a partial, a denture, or place an implant. And if they just say, you know, I don't like dentures, I don't like removal, I hate endo, I don't like extracting teeth, you know, uh, so, so, gosh, and, and, then, and then their next question is, why is my overhead 78%? Well, and, you know, and, so and it on us have the lowest the overhead. Practices, my, my overhead was 15%. 15%? Yeah. Is that because your wife was a volunteer? No, it was because I got rid of all the stuff I didn't need. The, but the other thing is I bought every single gadget you can possibly imagine. I had the first digital x-ray in the United States. You know, like I say, I made my own microscopes in 1977. You know, it's, um, think of this, Howard, and you and I are on the same page in that regard. Say that an endodontist does six root canals a day, okay? And say by using this type of combined simplify, eliminate, and enhance, that he could save 10 minutes per case. That's an hour a day. If he works 200 hours a year, or 200 days a year, that's 200 hours. That amounts to five weeks. Five weeks from just saving 10, pay, 10 minutes a patient. To me, that's astounding. And when I graduated from school, one of the things that was taught in many schools, particularly University of Alabama, was ergonomics. And it was primarily on a how to be efficient. And I don't think that we see nearly that much anymore. The other thing is we abdicate our judgment to marketing. And we have to be careful about where the marketing comes from. It's easier to find, it's much better to find out the answer, answers yourself, like you came to my office, than it is to rely on somebody else. So I think the biggest um, duty that a general dentist has for endodontics is diagnosis. Once he has that, 
the rest all needs to make sense. He needs to be able to justify everything he does from that point on. And you don't get that from marketing. And I see I'm, I'm on the scientific review committee, for instance, for the JOE. And and say what JOE stands for, for my homies. And what it's for the Journal of Endodontics. So I review a lot of the scientific articles. So you really need to pick out what's really important and what is really promotion and separate the two because you can get into trouble listening only to promotion. And that is one reason I like the European system better than the American system. The American system, uh, Americans are very cynical. You know, they, over, they overthrew the British. They're very anti-government. Everybody owns a gun. And you go to these conventions, and if an uh, owner of a company stands up there, they go, well, I'm not going to listen to you. You own the company. You're making a profit. Yet when you go to the largest dental meeting in the world, which is in Cologne, the Europeans, the Europeans don't want to listen to some middleman dentist out there who's an expert in all these things. They, they want to hear from the owner. And the, the, um, the Cologne meeting doesn't even have lectures. And you, you go there, and the European dentists will say, well, if you're John McSpadden and you own Nano Endo, I, I want to talk to you. An American says, well, I don't want to talk to you. You're trying to sell me a file. I want to go yeah. listen to some guy on the lecture circuit who's going to be an expert in all 15 systems, whatever. I, 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 always, yeah. I always jumped on Southwest Airlines and flew to the horse's mouth. I flew to you. I flew to Tulsa, met Ben. I flew to you know South Jordan and met Dan Fisher. I, I wanted to hear from the horse's mouth. And, and, and all those people I met were just damn good people. And I'd rather hear from them. And then they would tell me how the lecture circuit gets everything confused. Well, dental companies do a, a lot of good, but there are also barriers to progress, can be. I, for instance, had two instruments that have been very successful with Cybron, <clears throat> and I think a lot of Cybron. They've done a lot of good, okay? Uh, Which got swallowed up by Kerr, then swallowed by Danaher? Yeah. Well, Kerr and Cybron were always there together, but uh, they were not marketed together. But Cybron would not let me uh, lecture on the Quantec and the K3, which were my instruments because I spent so much time on the limitations of the instruments and they didn't want to hear that and they didn't want anyone else to hear that but as we spoke at the beginning of our conversation limitations are just as, as valuable if not more valuable than the capabilities you don't know what the capabilities are until you know the limitations of the capabilities right? So that was so, your first two files Quantec and or, oh. uh, K3. No, my first. But that, that was with Cybron. My first company was called NT Company, and that was the company that <laughs> that introduced nickel titanium files. It was called NT. Right. Okay. And the first files were called NT Files, and then that changed. We've had several companies since that time, but they were all from. And wasn't there a file war where it, it used to be very aggressive back then? Didn't, like, the place you were making your file, and if you don't want to answer this, I can edit it out, but the place you were making the file got bought by a competitor, and then and you got squeezed out of your own file? I did, and that's why I went to Cybron. I mean, that, 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 um, that's like a, uh, that's like a I crazy... Went to, I went to Ticom because all of a sudden I couldn't... My production could not, or my market could not increase. And then, okay, so, so, so your competitor bought the place that you were manufacturing your file, and then. Well, he wasn't a competitor at the time. We won't get into that, but all of a sudden, I. But there's a have, lot of behind-the-scenes wars yeah, in dentistry. Right. So I went to a company <laughs> called Ticom, and they manufactured micro drills for the print, printed circuit board industry. And I said, "Can you make this file?" And they made me one the next day. And so, um, and they were doing primarily the triangular file. So, the so what two file systems do you sell on nanoendo.com? Okay, let's get rid of some of this and I'll show you the difference. One is the triangle. Like so many, most of the files, the triangle came out in 1904. And that was the K-type reamer, 
which follow the K-type file. So this design has been there since commercially since 1904, and that was done by K Kerr. Okay. Wow, Kerr's been around since 1904. Before that time. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, was well, there was there a dentist named Kerr? There was. General dentist. Yes. Um, well, there were only yeah, yeah. I was gonna say 1904. Yeah, they all would have been I general. I think their biggest thing was making false teeth. Wow. And they were in York, Pennsylvania. So it's a very old company. They were in York, Pennsylvania. They still are. Yeah. Isn't that where Densply is? Or Den no, they're in Middle Ford, Delaware. No. Or Densply was in York, wasn't it? You're exactly right. I got the two confused. It's Densply that's in York. Uh, Kerr was. California? No. Wasn't in Orange County? N no, they were. I can't remember, Howard. I think that they were close to. I think they were in Pennsylvania as well. Okay. Well, that's where all the people were in 1904. Yeah. How many people were uh, west of the Mississippi? And I don't then? know why there. But anyway, that's that encompasses a lot of the files now. Um, Vortex, uh, a whole bunch of them are all triangular. Okay. And we have a file then that's triangular at the tip. There's maybe 10 different files that are triangular now. Popular files, your most popular files are triangular and cross-section. Um, that was 1904, and they, about the only difference is the metals or heat treatment or whatever the case may be, but they're pretty much triangular. Our files m morph into a trapezoid toward the handle. So when you think of the canal like this, it change, <coughs> changes to this. And these are the d d advantages that I talk about. And that's the exo endo file. Okay, one of the most effective designs, the, the, well, let me point out the pr limitation with this. All triangular files have a tip that's pretty much like the Washington Monument. So the blades start after the tip, primarily, okay? If you look at uh, an SEM of the tip of any triangular file, virtually any file, then this really doesn't go into the canal very easily unless the canal is the size of the instrument. So that's why you use a 10 or 15 or or 12 or whatever the case may be, okay? So that's the disadvantage of it, but it's a triangular file. And this, on first glance, you'd think this would be very counterintuitive that this would be more effective, but it is much more effective and also more flexible toward the handle, okay? Uh, for the reasons we discussed, Let's, a lot more area for debris, more flexible, these two cutting edges engage with the same forces the three did before, et cetera, okay? The other instrument is an instrument that also introduced, and this was in 1978, and it had a cross section like this. It was often called S-file. And that, a headstrom file, for instance, is like this. All right, and a headstrom file would not be good for reciprocation or continuous rotation because it just could not stand the torsional stress. Here you had two cutting edges and it could withstand the torsional stress, but the angle of incidence was very good, so it was sharp, and that was the unifile and the, and the Dynatrack, okay? So th the file that we have today is much like this, again, it's symmetrical at the tip, but as it migrates toward the handle, this cutting edge becomes shorter and shorter, okay? So this would be, for instance, an 06 taper, but here you have an 06, 03 taper. This blade tapers at a 3%. The same with the, um, the triangular file, 
these three blades may be an 06 taper, for instance, but then you have another flute that comes in here that gradually gets deeper and deeper, and it may be an 04 taper. So you have an 06, 04. And here you have an 03, 06. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have a rec recessive, or a, a blade that becomes recessive as you approach the handle. Here you have a flute that becomes more and more prominent as you approach the handle. So those are the two files. This is called the one endophile. Okay, so uh, you, you call it the one endophile. I, oh. I call it the one, that's the name of the file. Your, your, your file is the one <clears throat> the one endo file? What, this one is the one endo file, and this is the exo endo file. Okay, so is one endo file one one endo one word, or is it one it's, endo file? No, it's it's one word. So one endo. Yeah. And the other one was exo endo. Right. Exo endo. Exactly. And so it's two completely different systems. It's two different files. Yeah. So the systems can be the same. Some people are more comfortable with this. Um, do, you, do you on your website do you have an, 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 an explanation oh, yeah. all this? Yes. How what to, what kind of um, resource on your website? Videos? You said you talked about your, your uh, both. Book. Yeah, we have videos. How many videos do you have? I don't know, there may be six or something. See, so you've already got an online dental town course. You should uh, you should almost look at the online CE course. Of well, you should look at the video. You should look at the website, and see what you'd like, and oh, we're going to change the videos because one thing that I've learned is people don't sit down and listen to an hour presentation. So what we want to do first is in the first three minutes have all the key points and then have it interactive so they can expand on anything that they want to expand on. Well, I, I am true and false. Um, okay. The reason this podcast has gone viral is because um, Generation X is money is multitask. Everyone, they're all telling me they have an hour commute to work. That's why we do this hourly. Okay. Um, when I talk to people online CE, they say every once in a while they'll stop and look at their phone because they want to see something, but they're on their treadmill. I have um, lots of uh, women dentists who say that uh, Saturday mornings it takes them four hours to do their whole house. All the laundry, cooking, cleaning, clean the garage, everything about four hours. And they'll listen to four hours of whether Dental Town right. CE or podcast yeah. or everything. So well, I don't mean that that's all they get. So they, but so, it, so as that, long as it's not interrupted, they'll have links that they can go skip or whatever. Yeah. You know, um, we have a lot. I have a lot to learn in that regard. But we have a whole lot of people, for instance, that will. Uh, we most of them are about an hour long. A lot of people. So you will have watch, six one-hour videos. I don't even know how or something, something like, like that. that. Um, a lot of them are only watch 15 or 20 minutes. Oh, you get to see how long they're engaged. Yeah, and yeah. I, I hope... We track that, too. I hope it's not the first 15 or 20 minutes because the meat has been at the end. Now we want the meat to be at the beginning and then elaborate on each part of the meat. You yeah, that I mean? is, it's so good to have that. You know, before you know, I started out, I just had a magazine. You just mailed a magazine, and you yeah. had no idea what, what even was going on. Right. And now I love the, the digital component because now... You get to see, like, on the digital magazine, what pages they go to, how long do they stay, yeah. videos. A lot of people uh, track uh, videos, and they, they might say, oh, I have this many downloads. Yeah, but do you know if they were listened to for eight seconds or 60 minutes? And uh, that's yeah. why I like putting on Dental Town, so you can actually see how long they're lost. So you sell these direct or through a... I do, a, yeah. And so so if you go through a distributor, they would have taken... What, what, what percent would they have taken if you sold that through... Patterson, Shine, Benco, Burkhart. Um, is there a price difference direct versus distributor? What, why, why did you choose to sell direct? For one thing, I like the communication with the user. You know, because the last thing that a dentist will do is read the directions. <laughs> and to me, that's the most important part. You know, the nice thing is they don't have to change their technique for these files. And you can't rely, you cannot rely on feel, you know, and you can't, the problem that a dentist has is that 
he does not have controls. You can't do one tooth and then do another tooth and, and assume that they have the same relative values because one will have idiosyncrasies that the other one doesn't have. Uh, the other thing is he's not able to sit down and just compare 15 different files. And that's what I do. In fact, I have made a device, designed a device, spent an awful lot of money on a device that will do it with computer parameters. So I put in the parameters, and then you can use either bovine bone, or you can use an extracted tooth, or you can use plastic blocks, which are usually polycarbonate blocks. And I've actually had some polycarbonate blocks radiated so that they have the same micro hardness as dentin. And I feel like that's the best way because they all have the same dimensions. Okay? So I have done well over 2,000 tests now of different instruments, different sizes, different parameters, so that the dentist doesn't have to do that. And that's why it was reduced down to those three sentences. Now, there's more sentences if you really want to get into it. But if you never want to break a file again, use those three rules. I've never broken a, an instrument unless I broke one of those three rules. And say them again okay. succinctly. Okay. <clears throat> Don't go more than one millimeter at a time. Use a pecking motion. By that, I mean go in two millimeters, come out one. Two millimeters, come out one. Two millimeters, come out one. That's one millimeter of advancement each time. Applying the same pressure, and I don't know whether you were there, whether I was doing it when you attended a seminar or not, because I was trying to tell people how hard to push on the handpiece. I would actually tape a thumbtack on the end of the handpiece so that they wouldn't push you any harder than would become uncomfortable for them. But you just have to make a mental note, I'm pushing this hard, and when you get to a point that I, that's a little harder, that's the time to get out. If you always got out before you made a mistake, you'd never make a mistake. It's always when you decide, I'll go one more time, I'll push a little harder, that there's a problem. You ledge, you break an instrument, or whatever the case may be, but you got a problem, okay? And now, <clears throat> so that's the thing. Pecking motion, one millimeter at a time. You need to make at least a half a millimeter's worth of progress each time. Never going back to the same place. If you can't make any progress with the same amount of pressure, get out. And that's not a hard thing to determine. And when do you get out? When you get out, what do you change to? Another instrument, preferably one closest to the same size, but with a different taper and you do the same thing. And you do the same thing until you're done. That's now, a heck of an idea. They should put a little uh, tack there. Well, you wouldn't have to, th you just have to be conscious of it. <laughs> the biggest thing, you're working in a blind space and you're not thinking of what you're doing. You're following directions that are, I don't like cookbook directions. I like for you to have to think about what's going on. Okay, but then let's, let, then let's talk the reality because the reality is, they want to uh, engine driven, get this all the way to the X, you know, get this nice taper and then put sealer and put gutta percha and it looks beautiful on x-ray. But what percent of the debris bacteria infection is this file going to remove? What would you say, half? Okay. And then how you are they going to- if you go to the same place, one thing I don't like, I will raise a whole bunch of eyebrows when I say this. I've never established a glide path. I've never used patency files. If you're 360 degrees, or at least engaged on both sides of the canal, all the time, you're not going to ledge, and it's always going to follow the canal, particularly if you follow these three sentences. So I'm not going back to the same place, I'm not going through, I'm not pushing debris through the apex. I'm always cleaning the canal as much as I possibly can with that one instrument. And the way to do that is to have it fully engaged as much as possible. If I'm always making progress, it's always pulling debris out. And I can demonstrate this on, if you could, uh, on, if you, <clears throat> for instance, take a, a practice block and you cut off the end of it and you full it, put it full of ketchup and you put the end of it in ketchup and you do what I just said, you'll see 
the ketchup is always coming up through the canal. You're not pushing anything in advance of the canal. So when you have balanced forces, what are you doing? You're not screwing into the canal. You're <coughs> unscrewing and making progress. You're pushing debris in front of yourself. So I, it's not that I advocate not doing that, but if you want the most efficient removal of debris, it's continuous rotation with continuous progress. But when, but when it's all prepared, yeah. what percent of the uh, two, you know, the, the, the canal is not round, it's flared, tapered, who knows? Well, what, that's what, what, what that's percent why of the in, yeah. infection is removed, and, and what what percent of the you think the infection is? Removed? Because I I think a lot of kids might be, you know, doing radiographic beauty art pieces. You know, they get all the way to the end, they fall it out, they put sealer, it looks gorgeous, but they 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 established, you know, the files to enlarge and so you can get sodium hypochlorite down there. I mean, wouldn't you say the sodium hy hypochlorite is killing the other half and the first half? The file's removing probably half the infection, and then the bleach is killing the other half, or is that too yeah, simplistic? Yeah, you may be forming a smear layer if you're overusing your files. And that, you see, with this design here of a triangle, each of these blades meet the surface to be cut at a 60 degree angle. That's not a cut at all. That's a scrape, right? So some of your debris is being pushed into the dental tubules. So now then you have inorganic and organic debris forming plugs into the dental uh, canals. So you want to minimize that. And you minimize that with a sharp instrument. And you minimize it with the minimum use of the file. All right. So that's why you can spend an awful lot of time using one instrument to get to the end of the canal just for the sake of saying I can do it with one file. It can be done, but it takes a long time and you're really forming a good smear layer. So it's a minimum use, the most efficient use of the file that to me is the most important. But you're going to miss some, some aberrations of the canal because they're god awful shaped. You know, I don't know how much coffee you have in there, but they might be shaped like that, for instance. Mm -hmm. ribbon shape and then you just got a round preparation in the middle of it and that's why I started using <clears throat> I would put a curve in the canal or in the instrument rather like this and this is now the true shape but I've been doing that forever in fact I used to make my own I had you know the big old soldering irons the big round ones I put a round cut or on the end of one of the file uh, one of the soldering irons and a female to match it on the other side. I would heat it and drop it in some water and that would heat heat set this design. So then you can go up and down. But what I did after that is that is a two-dimensional bend was to bend an instrument around a, a matrix, a shaft, heat it and pull it. And that gave me a spiral like, well, like this, and that would get into some of the more intricacies of the canal. But uh, the biggest thing is you're not going to get into all of them. There's too many anastomoses and things that you never see until you see a three-dimensional rendering of the actual tooth. And that's why irrigation is so important. And I think is gaining more and more importance. Irrigation is everything, isn't it? It's a lot. And but you you mentioned um, sodium hypochlorite, household bleach. Do you do that? Do you use it straight? Did you dilute it fifty fifty? How do, how did you use your bleach? Well, it's usually four or five percent, and you use that continu. Well, well, is that out of the grocery store? I mean, no, I don't. What, I don't, what percent is it at Walmart when you buy a gallon of bleach? Yeah, no, I don't know. Okay, and you also mentioned EDTA to remove the smear layer. Right. But you didn't mention chlorhexidine gluconate. Are you a fan of chlorhexidine gluconate or not really? Oh, yeah. I am. But really, I think the only two things that are necessary, and I'm working on another. You may have heard of uh, Hydrox. Hydrox? Yeah. Don't they make cookies? Are those elves? And maybe I'm not saying it the right way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, for several decades, there has been 
ionization of water. You take plain old water, uh, you apply a charge to it, and the and add a pinch of salt, and you produce uh, hydrochloric acid. Okay, the problem is you have a positive charge and and a negative charge, and the problem is separating the two. When you have a positively charged hypochlorous acid, which is HOCl, it will kill virtually anything except human tissue, or except it will kill virtually any microbe, I'll put it that way, whether it's bacteria or fungi, or spores, or even viruses, okay? Uh, it can be extremely effective, and you can also drink it. It was developed initially in Russia for battlefield wounds, casualties, where they had open wounds with dirt and everything else. They just flooded it with hypochlorous acid and met with tremendous results. In fact, I can show you some for horses, for instance. So it's not toxic to the tissue like sodium hypochlorite. Really wouldn't matter that much if some were extruded through the apical foramen, but it's very effective in killing microorganisms. But it does nothing to the inorganic components of the smear layer, all right? And that's why you need the EDTA. So, and that is very effective. I want to ask you another question. It seems like uh, dentists are divided on how they look at an x-ray. Some, you know, it seems like about half or what we call apical barbarians that like to see the puff of sealer out the end so they know they got it all out. And the other half are pulp lovers where they like to stay a half millimeter from the apex and, and they see, uh, are you a pulp lover or an apical barbarian? Well, if I have my choice, I'd want it sealed to the apex but not extruded through the apex because that can cause post-optic pain. And then you have to absorb the sealant, you know, and I don't think that there's a reason to have all those puffs, even though I don't think it causes any pathology. It can cause pain and retard, I think it can retard, retard healing. It has to be absorbed sometime. So why do it when you don't have to? Does that make? Sure, that's an outstanding answer. And there's ways to do that. And then do you also, um, when, when you listen to how people describe the place sealer, I mean, they're, most people are talking about just a little bitty amount. But whenever I'm standing in a dental office and I'm watching my buddies. You see a lot. You, they, they seal. You see a lot. I mean, some even will pick up a lentinula and fill up the whole canal. What, so talk, talk about sealer. How much, how little? Well, I, mean, I bit, like the interface of sealer and gutta percha to be minimal. But I like for it to have a, you were talking about formulas before. I can give you a formula for flow, if you like. And because I design uh, flow equals the difference in pressure, how much pressure you put on the gutta perch or whatever the case, times pi r to the fourth, humongous number over eight times the length times one over the viscosity. Okay, now what does that mean? If you're using a plugger, the harder you push on it, the more flow you're gonna have, right? If you have a radius of say like a 20, and you enlarge it up for the canal, and you enlarge that to a 40, how much flow, how much more flow do you have in the 40 than you have in the 20? Power to the fourth means it's 16 times the amount of flow here than there is here. So that's the difference for irrigation if you have, I don't, I'm not advocating a 40, just means that's a big number. If you enlarge the apex a little bit more than what you had before, then you're going to get a lot more flow. And that means you're going to get a lot more exchange of the irrigant, okay? And it's going to be more effective. Over eight times the length. Now, if you have a canal 
and many times I will see an advocate carry their plugger down to right here and you have four to six millimeters left down here that's not going to move very far you're not really changing anything here when the plugger only goes to right here okay so what does that mean if I go right here I will have four times as much flow does that make any sense? Yes. Do okay. you do you also believe that the there's no irrigation beyond the depth of the irrigation needle? No. For that reason, the diameter, the length, it can be back. The op, the potentiation of it, whether it's with. Uh, agitating with ultrasonics or whether you're heating it up with ultrasonics, as the case may be. You can agitate it with sonics, but if you really want to do heating and agitation, then I'd use ultrasonics. I've got all tangled up here, but. So are you, uh, are you recommending agitation for the um, um, leaks? Because it seems like when, um, it seems like most people are just uh, the only agitation is is with with their fire squirt in it. Yeah, I mean they're 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 irrigating with with bleach. And yeah, a lot of time, and then when they're done, they usually leave the canal filled, then go back in with a file, you know, a few more times. Yeah, and that's why I like continuous irrigation, is that you are continu continuously feeding the uh, irrigation into the canal. Uh, <clears throat> So consequently, some people have to leave the irrigation in a long time. If you have irrigation the whole time, rather than just stopping every once in a while and putting a few squirts in there, you're not, you're, you're not accomplishing But is there any it. continuous irrigation systems out there? No, except for the assistant. The assistant. Yeah, and that may, re that may require six-handed dentistry. How much longer until we can replace the assistant with a droid? Right out of Star Wars, like R2-D2. Many times I did root canals without an assistant because of the rubber dam clamp that I told you about. Um, but um, let me put it this way. I think continuous irrigation is optimal. That's key. Well, I think, um, I think we should continue this. Um, this is one behavior they have. My, <clears throat> my goal in the podcast was that I noticed back in the day that the dentists who got out of school that took 100 to 500 hours of CE a year, they just had really great careers. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just wanted to make uh, your CE, uh, you know, what were your four things again? You mean the one millimeter at a time? No, 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 the four, the oh. four, the four words you had. Uh, combine. Combine. Simplify. Combine. Simplify. Eliminate. Eliminate. And enhance. Enhance. If you do the first three without the last one, or and that's what I did. I, I combined their their study club, which only happened once a month. I combined it with their um, their commute to work, so it's multitasking. So I eliminated them having to go to the study club, and I enhanced it by getting. Uh, I, I knew my <clears throat> my most value added thing I had is I had a connection to great guys like you. And, uh, and and the, uh, the, the, the online CE is a totally different behavior. They want AGD credit, they want ADA credit, they're working on their FAGD, they're trying to get their license renewed. So I think we should continue this on, uh, uh, and that's the difference uh, on your website. Did your website, do you offer online CE credit? No. Yeah, so that, that's a totally different uh, motivational thing they have is to uh, get, the, get the credit for their licensures, for their... Well, then we, um, we ought to put some videos on your yeah yeah so let's get um let's get howard goldstein um and uh john i um we'll, we'll get him on the deal but uh i just want to say uh i'll wrap this up um look for john's court go to nanoendo.com look for the one file look for the exo file right. and i can uh, i can assure you this guy knows uh more about endo then probably all of my listeners combined. And, uh, I mean, you're just an amazing man, and God dang, you were you were mind blowing in the '80s and the '90s. Uh, you're just you're a legend in my mind and all my friends' mind. Uh, John, seriously, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry well, it's great to see you. and for thank endodontics. Thank you for all you've done, and I'm always as close as my phone. Oh, yeah, can my homies contact you? You can have my personal phone. Okay, everyone can have my personal phone. What's your personal phone number? It's four two three five zero three. 
six eight eight nine. Okay, say it again. Four two three five zero three six eight eight nine. And what's your email? JTMC at me dot com. Okay, JTM for John Thomas McSpadden MC right. at me dot com. So that's the uh, me is the uh, the i the Apple right. email. Yeah, and the website's on well, uh, nanoendo dot com. Nanoendo dot com, and that will give you other phone numbers as well as e- email addresses. Okay, and if they live in Tennessee, can they come by and see you at Chattanooga? If they live in California, they can come by and see me in Chattanooga. Oh, oh, you mean you mean they? Oh, if they live in California, they can come out and see you. Sure, always. And that's, uh, I'll tell you what, the, those, those Southern boys, you guys just got a lot of hospitality, don't you? Is that that's a Southern thing, isn't it? I don't know, but you're always welcome. Yeah, I well. knew you when. <laughs> Oh, my God. You had hospitality when I was a nobody. I'm still a nobody. uh, But, uh, hey, buddy, seriously, thanks so much. Always great to see you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ryan.